old world monkeys actually can't get SIV, which is the cousin of HIV in humans, whereas new world monkeys can and humans can, obviously. So we have a gene called TRIM5-alpha, which basically fits around the capsid of the virus like a baseball in a glove and prevents it from infecting. And so it seems like what happened, and you can, you can actually make a few mutations in TRIM5-alpha and figure, find that this is true, is that TRIM5-alpha once protected against an HIV-like pathogen in the primate genomes. And then there was this challenge from this massive endogenous retrovirus, and it was so bad that the genome lost the ability to fight off these HIV-like viruses in order to restrict this endogenous retrovirus. And you can see it because that retrovirus integrates into our genome. There are like latent copies, like the you know half bodies of this right. virus all throughout our DNA code. And then this particular retrovirus went extinct. Reasons unknown, no, no one knows why. But we didn't like re-update that piece of our host defense machinery to fight off HIV again. And so we're in a situation where you can go in and take human cells and make just a couple edits in that trim 5 alpha gene. And it's currently protecting against a virus which no longer exists. And you can edit it back to actually restrict HIV dramatically. You're saying that in our genomes, we can find some extended sequence which encodes how, how to bind specifically to the kind of virus that SIV is. And the amount of evolutionary signal you would need in order to have a multiple base pair sequence, so each nucleotide is, you consecutively would have to mutate in order to like finally get the sequence that binds to SIV. Th that seems almost implausible that you could. La I, I mean, I guess evolution works, so like mm -hmm. we can come up with new genes, right? But like, how how would that, that, that even work? Yeah, yeah. I think I think a great explanation for understanding a lot of evolution and how you're able to actually adapt to new environments, new pathogens, is that gene duplication is possible, and this explains a whole lot. If you look at most genes in the genome, they actually arise at least at some point in evolution from a duplication event. So that means you've got gene A, it's doing, you know, it's you know, performing some job, and then some new environmental concern comes along. Maybe Maybe it's like a lack of a particular source of nutrient. Maybe it's a pathogen challenging you. And maybe gene A, if it were to dedicate all of its energies, so to speak, you were to mutate it to solve this new problem, could be adapted with a minimal number of mutations. But then you lose its original function. So we have this nice feature of the genome, which is it can just copy and paste. And so occasionally what will happen in evolution is you get a copy-paste event. Now I've got two copies of gene A, and I can preserve my original function in the original copy. And then this new copy can actually mutate pretty freely because it doesn't have a strong selective pressure on it. So most mutations might be null. I've got two copies of the gene. I can have lots of mutations in it accumulate. Nothing bad really happens because I've got my backup copy, my original. And so that you can end up with drift. So you're saying that even though the per base pair mutation rate might be one in a billion, if you've got 100 copies of a gene, then the sort of like mutation rate on a gene uh, or on a low hamming distance um, sequence to the one you're aiming for might actually be quite high. And so you can actually get the target sequence. It's not that the base rate goes up. It's not like DNA polymerase is, you know, more erroneous or that you're just like doubling it. It's not like, oh, well, I've got two copies. I, that, that is true, but I don't think it's the main mechanism. The main, One of the main mechanisms that just makes it difficult for evolution to solve a problem is that if a mutation breaks a gene or somewhere along the path of edits, yeah. imagine there are three edits that take a host defense gene from restricting SIV to restricting this new nasty PT endogenous retrovirus. Well, if one edit just breaks the gene, two edits just breaks the gene, three edits fixes it, it's really hard for evolution to find a path whereby you're actually able to make those first two edits because they're net negative and net, net negative for fitness. And so you need some really weird contingent circumstances. So through duplication, you can create a scenario where those first two edits are totally tolerated. They have like no effect on fitness. You've got your backup copy. It's doing its job. And so even though the mutation rate is low, some of these edits actually aren't that at large. I, I'm going to forget the number of edits, for instance, in trim 5 alpha for this particular phenomenon we're talking about from memory, but it's in like the tens. It's not, it's not that you need massive kilobase scale rearrangements. Mm -hmm. It's actually a fairly small number of edits. And basically you can just align the sequence of this gene in new world versus old world monkeys and then for humans. And you find there's a very high degree of conservation. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.